Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, this presentation. Um, I'm going to start out with a couple of caveats. Um, the presentation itself is not original. It is, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm a technician. Um, and it's been really prompted more than anything else um, by the recognition, my recognition, that things can't continue the way they are. And I'm a strong believer, though, nonetheless, in the processes that have been evolved over the years, um, processes that dovetail to promote safety and avoid errors, um, but as such produce an element of stagnation, not, not in ideas, but in a reluctance to try new things until fully proven and safe. Change is also further stifled somewhat due to the immense costs involved and the need to make money. Um, and so all those, all those uh, ideas are justified, all those reasons are justified, there needs to be a more open mindset towards change and opportunity that technology can bring. So when I agreed to do this discussion, um, I, I originally um, was working on quite a large number of assumptions. And I realised that, in fact, I needed a much more basic understanding of, of the possibilities that are out there at the moment. And so this presentation tries to present what I found online in a, a, a balanced manner as possible and then to take those ideas and try and see further out as to what is the likely outcome of where we're going. So there's a general introduction into why we're looking at these different energy sources. Um, the overall position with the COVID pandemic has also prompted some further uh, review um, in what's happening with aviation and what needs to happen. Um, so what I and, and sorry to finish off here, the, the, we're looking at current alternatives, hydrogen, electric, combination of the same energy sources, uh, likely routes for hydrogen power and timing possibilities if it does move ahead. And then from a lessor's point of view and from uh, an owner's point of view, what are the potential impacts moving down alternative energy? I think my role here mostly now is, uh, is more as an old boy, perhaps learning a few new tricks, and attempting to assist change that's beneficial, but also provide continuity of methods that are proven safe and, what, and have a good reason in the first place. So I think it's trying to find a, a, a path between what is obviously or s seems obviously very, very uh, beneficial, but at the same time um, needs to be tempered with the idea of safety and, and what has proven useful over the years. I also decide or believe that despite many different political views and the way that things have been presented, there now appears to be sufficient scientific weight of thought to support that climate change has been affected adversely by human activity. Now, the level of that adverse impact, I think, is very debatable, but nonetheless, I think it, it, it is pretty true now. And it also seems to me that as humanity's numbers increase, then it would seem logical that any adverse reaction is likely to also increase unless we find mitigants in what we do. And overall, I find most political solutions both short-sighted and relatively self-centred, but the Paris Climate Accord seems to be an exception. Um, it seems to be an acknowledgement that we can't keep doing business as usual if we want to leave anything worthwhile to our, de our descendants. And Aviation being a contributor to uh, carbon emissions and, and uh, global warming, I think has to take its, uh, its, its uh, has to be serious about where we go going forwards. Just a quickie, I'm not going to go through the chart. It's very self-explanatory, and uh, the presentation will be available afterwards. Um, but when you look at the figures, aviation currently produces around two percent of the world's global emissions. Now, that doesn't sound like very much. Um, and probably with COVID, it's even maybe a little less at the moment because certainly um, the number of aircraft flying around is, is hugely less than it was. Um, but nonetheless, 2% um, of a large figure is still 2% of a large figure that is growing or will grow once the fleet starts to get back into service. Um, and a further 
uh, detriment is that a large proportion of these emissions are at high altitude and so science considers that they're somewhat more detrimental for that that reason but i think that it's human nature to want to travel and to see new things experience new things but i believe that if we carry on as as we do um, travel will either become the preserve of the very rich or will become potentially socially unacceptable given the amount of um, emission that it does produce. I'm not talking about right now, I'm not talking about immediately, but I'm talking about in the medium, near to medium term. Um, I put this in as a, as a data forecast that uh, it's I've taken a lot of these graphs, I'm not worried about specific figures, it's, it's more to illustrate uh, the overall ideas and these graphs are mirrored throughout the internet wherever you look. Um, even looking at this, this chart, there are others that say are slightly uh, more optimistic and there are others that are less so, but if you look at this chart you'll see that even if we change to 100% sustainable aviation fuels now that by 2045 2050 we will be back up at 2005 levels now obviously that has to be tempered by how big is the fleet and how things grow back again so there's an element of, of uh, it, it's it's not certain this is exactly correct but the trend i think is unmistakable and i think one of the reasons why I find this so important is because of a discussion that I was present at um, back in around 1995. Um, we were talking at American Island, I believe, at the time uh, and praising ourselves on after looking at accidents and, and safety and what have you, um, and looking at the reactive way that changes are made within aviation. and praising ourselves effectively on the safety record, how it was improving all the time, how it was down in absolute numbers, um, and that the ratio of accidents to flight hours at the time, though, was still pretty static. So, although we were all feeling very good, somebody then piped up and said, well, if this same lay ratio is maintained and the fleet continues to grow at the rate that it's going to, then over the next 10 years, there will likely be a major accident nearly every day somewhere in the world. And it was a wake-up call to most of us then at the time that, that the ratio needed to be greatly reduced in order to, to accommodate the, the growth of the fleet. And the only way to do that was to be proactive and not to be reactive. The result of that um, was effectively QMS and then which evolved into SMS, uh, the, the safety management systems that are commonplace now and, and are, are slowly being or have been put into the system um, and have again improved safety and accident prevention. Personally I think we're very very close to that kind of point within climate change and within uh, emissions that we need to take the opportunity while we can and, and make this work. So um, I also then had a quick look around and thought, well, people keep talking about climate change, but what does that actually mean? It's very, very easy to say one and a half, two degrees, um, and that's if things go well. Um, there are some estimates that it could be as much as four degrees. But I thought that the interesting side of this was when I saw the BBC compared uh, cities uh, to what they feel like now and what they're likely to feel like in 2050, where London could feel like Barcelona, Edinburgh like Paris, Leeds like Melbourne, and Cardiff like Montevideo. That then, to me, brings home um, the meaning of, of this, because when considered against countries that are already very hot now and have trouble with water, where does that leave them? I think that social attitudes towards aviation are evolving, and I think the pandemic in many ways has sharpened the views of this, although maybe not the effects. Um, it is it is obvious that in certain places the social attitudes towards aviation are very negative. 
Um, so the question I think we have to ask as an industry, if we want to remain a viable industry and we want to travel with, with mass travel to occur, is what do we do and how quickly can we do it? So IATA has been pretty um, proactive to be fair. Uh, they've proposed a lot of things, but they have very little in the way of um, ability to uh, regulate. It comes back down to governments, it comes back down to the industry. Um, and that in turn comes from customers and from money. So uh, that seems to be the underlying root. Currently, um, where we stand at the moment, there are roughly, there's two, two effects at the moment um, with carbon offset and sustainable fuels. Sustainable fuels are moving very quickly um, and seem to be uh, achieving quite uh, promising results. They're certainly reducing carbon emissions, but regardless of that, they still have, they take quite a lot of um, land area and a, and a lot of um, uh, resources to, to develop. And we don't know yet whether they can uh, produce sufficient sustainable fuel for aviation and other users as well. Um, so as we saw on the chart before, if we went to fully sustainable use, we are still burning significant uh, amounts of uh, carbon. Um, carbon offset is obviously already going on and a good term, short term solution, but again, it only reduces carbon, it kicks the prog prog problem down the road. It doesn't actually really change things significantly overall. I put open road to technology on here because at the time it was, it was when it was first developed or first proposed back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, it was going to be a 25% uh, or more fuel saving and efficiency. And I believe that um, it still has uh, some possible um, uh, efficiencies that could be used. It has problems with noise and it hasn't actually taken off. So it's questionable of the, the values that it can bring. It, it, one would have thought that given the time already that it would have um, progressed further if there was some um, great benefits, but um, I think it shouldn't be um, discounted entirely. Um, that then leaves us newer electric, hybrid electric, hydrogen propulsion as uh, elements of uh, energy storage and carbon or, uh, uh, avoidance of carbon use. Um, going forwards. Um, battery propulsion, electric hybrid are uh, effectively uh, obviously an electric uh, driven powertrain um, which is more or less 100% efficiency in terms of uh, the use of the um, electricity out of a battery. Um, hydrogen propulsion uh, is somewhat less so um, uh, and uh, they all have to Although they have no carbon emission during flight, um, they do potentially have the possibility of carbon emission during uh, manufacture. And so that needs to be one of our uh, thoughts. So starting out just quickly and running through, um, batteries are used to store energy, obviously, but they need charging. So where does that electricity come from? If it comes from the grid, if it comes from uh, fossil fuels, then it's debatable about what you're actually uh, achieving. Although batteries are still evolving, they're very evolving very rapidly at the moment. Um, there is an improving, uh, a continually improving uh, efficiency in terms of uh, storage against size and weight. Um, electric motor efficiencies are also improving all the time so we've got a potential powertrain battery electric motor driving propeller which is is very effective and the pros of that are there's no direct fuel on board there's no emissions while flying um, but the cons are that batteries are heavy still regardless of, of uh, progress and the second thing which is not often considered but is the 
fact that they don't get lighter as the fuel is used from them. So regardless of, of uh, what happens uh, as you go along, um, the batteries are still there, they're still heavy and they still have to be carted around. So they make uh, the possibility of batteries for longer range as uh, extremely uh, uh, imperfect at the moment. However, I would like to add, if you look on the left hand uh, look on the left hand side, that there are um, a, a, a many many aircraft at the moment with either pure electric or electric hybrid uh, with a gasoline a hybrid that are available. That are some are certified, some are close to certification. Um, there's many many ideas, and uh, for me, I look at these with a great deal of um, optimism. So, batteries. For light aircraft with a short range, the solution really is as good as it gets. Um, but um, as soon as you need a greater range, um, even in general aviation, then battery powered smaller aircraft can only really get that range by combining the battery power with some other form of um, fuel. Now, whether that fuel is fossil fuel, which it is at the moment, um, where the battery and the fossil fuel are used together for takeoff and landing, um, and then the fossil fuel use is a reduced power for crews and therefore um, reduces carbon emissions, um, is a great one. I mean, the best one is still with hydrogen because hydrogen produces no fossil uh, fuel burning. Um, but again, hydrogen presents its own problems, and uh, and and I'm. Um, get onto that in, in the next uh, slide or two. Um, just to make life really nice and difficult for me, um, I came across references yesterday to let the liquid natural gas as another solution. And to be honest, I haven't covered that here. Uh, and I think it's potentially interesting and shouldn't be disregarded, but I can't make any more comments on that as a comparison at this point. So, Hydrogen, quick description, because I was, I've learned a lot from this just looking around myself. It's the most abundant element on Earth. Unfortunately, um, it almost always exists um, as a uh, part of other elements, water, methane, natural gas, etc., and requires to be cracked out of those elements in order to be utilized. It does occur naturally in uh, nature in very small quantities out of things like biomass but being very very light it um, it rises and uh, rises into the atmosphere and is effectively more or less unusable so how do we get it well the hydrogen is is cracked out of uh, these other uh, compounds with electrolysis which in itself obviously needs energy and it needs heat so in order to do that you need to gather energy in order to make it in order to power the electrolysis so again you have to look at where does that power come from if it comes from the grid which is from fossil fuel power and coal power um, uh, energy etc you again it's much like battery you're, you're learning you're 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 gaining nothing so to make it most sense it really has to come from geothermal wind wave hydroelectric green sources of energy which uh, will and which should be planned in a central point where the that power can be used to produce the hydrogen and make it ready for use hydrogen itself um, is a great store of energy it is uh, in terms of um, energy efficiency it is um, very much more effective uh, than fossil fuel like jet fuel um, the problem lies that um, energy is uh, based upon the weight as we all know the weight of fuel is what we we load our aircraft up in order to get the range and the, the energy necessary to 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 move but with hydrogen, it's very much more problematic because it's in gas form, and therefore, although very, very light, um, not dense, and in order to 
have a sufficient weight to make it work, um, it has to be also compressed, otherwise we just don't have enough volume in an aeroplane. The good thing about it is when compressed and uh, when cooled to make the compression effective, the effective store of energy of energy in versus energy out gives hydrogen a percentage efficiency of around 60 percent which is far far greater than fossil fuel uh, for the same weight but not as good as battery but the most important part of this is that if you use the energy in a static point then the difference in, in efficiency is very apparent batteries are far far better storage than hydrogen but as soon as you start to move, as soon as uh, you put it in a moving vehicle, then the overall efficiency between hydrogen and battery becomes a lot less obvious. The cost of production and the weight of associated with batteries is actually makes hydrogen and fuel cell uh, power uh, much, in fact, slightly more efficient than than uh, than battery powered. And to give you a quick oversight in this, I, I've done this on a battery powered vehicle because it was simple to get the data and simple to compare it. But for a standard battery powered car, whatever it's worth, with a standard transmission, no, no super duper um, lightweight this or lightweight that, but, but a standard kind of mass produced car is running at around 2,260 odd kilos for uh, including the batteries. And in order to drive that car some 300 miles, then you need 1.77 million BTU of energy, which in this case we're taking from liquid natural gas. When you compare that with a fuel cell powered vehicle, the, the vehicle is nearly or approximately half of the weight because the fuel cell and the drivetrain by comparison to the battery bank is, is so much lighter it's, it's uh, it makes a big big difference and the overall power that's required from the liquid natural gas is around half of what that used for the for the same 300 miles you i might not be spawn with these figures okay they're, they're 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 illustrative only and the the difference in efficiency between these may be less it may be it may be more but the bottom line is is that once you take battery weight into account, then at that point there, um, the, the efficiency changes ra radically. And the intent of this is to illustrate that you cannot consider the use of power on an individual basis. It, ha it has to be evaluated on a system type basis uh, from obtaining the, the power in the first place, if you like, from the well as natural gas or oil, and to the point of, of, of uh, putting it on the road or, or in the air. So, this then comes, how do we utilize such an abundant element, which it is, non-carbon emitting, great, high energy store, great, what's, what's good, all of those things, but what's bad is the hurdles to using it are quite significant too. So, um, obviously, as I've already said, it needs to be it needs to come from renewable um, electricity in the first place for the electrolysis. If we do central production, it allows the use of um, of effective uh, renewable sources. Um, electrolysis itself uh, takes place in uh, at the moment regular in, in sort of normal regular operation in three different processes. Um, the oldest one, easiest and uh, most used, but least efficient, is an alkaline um, method uh, used within the with the the heat and with the electricity. There's then proton exchange membrane (PEM). Um, I'm using this just to, to to help you if you are interested in looking further at it. Um, this is um, effectively uh, around the middle of these two, and it's large or small scale. Um, but it is the best solution for local small-scale production if you have a green source of energy locally. And then the most efficient 
um, which uses the least electricity is solid oxide electrolysis cells. And the drawback with these is the temperatures involved are very much higher. So again, this one um, suits itself to central production rather than, than local production. Once produced, how do we move the hydrogen around? Um, we can put it in a gas pipe, but at the end of it all, you've got to move an awful volume to, to shift it around. It's cheap to move, um, but at the moment, the infrastructure is relatively poor. And one thing that, although you can use current um, gas pipes and, and, and current infrastructure, um, it, it must be noted that hydrogen has a very uh, poor, very detrimental effect on uh, metals. It causes embrittlement um, and so uh, has to be carefully handled from that point of view in the terms of piping. So relatively cheap, not much infrastructure currently, good for point to point, but what happens when it gets to its end point? How do you then shift the hydrogen? Or where do you put it? How do you get it into the aeroplane? Well, in order to get the weight against the volume into the aircraft, we really have to use uh, a more complex process of compression and cooling. So the hydrogen has to be cooled um, a great deal. It has to go very cold. It has to be compressed, and, and the examples are given at around 5,000 to 10,000 PSI. Um, once cooled and compressed, it's put into um, uh, capsules or pipes, uh, which are reinforced to make sure that they uh, can take the pressure and at the same time they are generally made of composite because they're not affected in the same manner as metal for embrittlement. So from that point of view it makes um, the uh, infrastructure a lot simpler um, and delivery re relatively simple and as we'll see as we get further on this idea has been um, taken up by uh, certainly one or two of the uh, potential new entrants to the business. Anyone, just to, to let you know how the hydrogen is used once you get it on board the aircraft, you've got a choice. You can either pass it through a fuel cell, um, it mixes with oxygen uh, through a membrane. That combination, recombination of the hydrogen and the oxygen releases electricity and at what comes out is a combination of H2O, water, and uh, so it, it's simple, it's cheap, it works well. Um, I'll take that back, it's not cheap because the uh, internal um, uh, elements used, there are some pretty expensive uh, metals and things used within, but again, much like in years gone by with um, automobile uh, catalytic computer converters where there was a great deal of concern about the, the precious metals used in those. Uh, to me, I think that that's one thing that can be absorbed relatively easily. The other alternative is to use hydraulic directly, um, basically just pipe it into a, a, an equivalent modern jet engine where all you're really doing is changing the fuel um, methods, the, the fuel, cell, the fuel um, delivery because the hydrogen will burn and very similar to jet fuel, it just needs to be controlled in a different manner. And the, 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 the wonder of this is that um, if, you if you utilize that technique, the byproduct again is water. It, it's, uh, no, there's no fossil fuel, there's no carbon emission, there's no, uh, there's no uh, global warming effect. So, the hurdles to adoption. Um, production, obviously, we've got to produce enough to make flying airplanes around viable um, and we've got to do it at a reasonable cost because you can't do it at just any old cost. Um, and uh, so that, that that's the, the, the one of the initial problems, um, green hydrogen, acceptable cost. Distribution takes more energy than fossil fuels because obviously, as I've said, we need to compress and cool and we need to, to do. But at the same time, um, a capsule with liquid hydrogen in is relatively easily handled um, and uh, works very well. Um, one of the things that I think 
we need to consider if we do move forward with this idea is perception, public perception and, and industry perception. Um, we need to make sure that we can reassure people that hydrogen is safe and can be handled safely and reliably. Um, and I think the other side of the perception here is that any change to an incumbent known process which we have at the moment will also by its own nature attract resistance. So uh, unless we can make the benefits obvious, which I think you can when you look at it, um, I see this as being uh, something that needs, needs to be managed properly. So what's going to drive us to um, use hydrogen or not? Um, aviation at the moment is still an attractive business. Maybe not so with COVID so much. Um, there's obviously uh, detrimental effects, but it will recover. There is a need for moving of people around. There is a, a need for trade and business and cargo. And it will recover in the coming years. It is a relatively traditional conservative business. And therefore, I, I think like all businesses at the moment, is very much open to disruption by modern methods and new technology ideas. I think if you look at most industries, um, computerization, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, all of these new ideas and techniques are slowly filtering into most industries. And I think it will also f uh, filter into aviation. It's just a matter of how quickly we encourage and allow it and control it against the, the benefits that it brings. Um, I believe that social views will accelerate any reasonable alternative that can actually work at a reasonable cost. So for me, I, I see that as a, an intangible that actually works likely in favour of hydrogen. And then I came to a final point, which I thought, well, can we simply incrementally improve current processes indefinitely? Um, if not, then the assumption that has to be made is that it's only timing that is a question, not effect. Okay, so what makes sense going forward? Uh, one thing that's become very obvious during my look at this is that one size just does not fit all. Batteries are a good solution for short range and for general aviation, for um, trips around the lighthouse, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, for longer range, it's almost certain that a battery hybrid will be necessary, even for general aviation. Um, even looking, if you look at the, the uh, aircraft that are being produced at the moment and that are flying around, they, the majority of them have some form of hybridism uh, for those that want to go anywhere other than uh, local flights around the, the airfield. Um, and for short, term, uh, short to medium term, um, hydrogen to me at least gives a, uh, a reasonable, a very, very efficient and, and a potential solution. Um, I thought I'd just throw this out. I was on a, um, a webinar uh, a week or two ago that was uh, sponsored by Universal Hydrogen, who are what I would call one of these disruptors. Um, it was a very interesting presentation, and of course, like everything, um, very, very upbeat, and everything's going to be you know, wonderful. But I did see, uh, what I saw in it was, was um, a very, very positive and a very, very sensible approach to a quick solution. And what Universal Hydrogen are doing are working on um, the method of distribution of the hydrogen. They're working with others to, who will provide the hydrogen at the most economical cost. And then they're working with another couple of companies called Plug Power and Magnix uh, on the electric solutions where they're improving the, the electric motors. Now, I don't want to, this is not an advert for them, but what I liked about it was 
they're intending to in, in, in introduce this on current aircraft. Uh, there's, there's on the website there's a, a review of a Dash 8 and also of a, an Italian P2012 Traveller. Um, and both of these are intended and are in the process of being modified as an STC change. So a supplemental type certificate, a major change, but nonetheless, we're not redesigning the wheel here. We're, we're taking a current airplane and we are making it work with a hydrogen power solution. So the intent, I think the best thing, I'm not gonna to make too many comments on this because I think you need to look at the website itself if you're interested, but certainly on the webinar, the intent with this is to have um, a passenger usable uh, aircraft within the very near future. I put three to four years because I'm slightly, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to be a little um, conservative, but it could be a lot less. Uh, there's, there's, it's a very interesting um, idea and a very interesting solution. Um, another one that's going at the moment is one called The Right One. Um, it's a company, a design company that's working together with uh, EasyJet to look for a solution to uh, effectively a 320 size, 319 size um, uh, regional operation. There's no chance that this is going long range, this is this with the amounts of uh, energy that can be stored and everything else. Um, but with quick swap batteries to, to do the, um, the uh, turnarounds and um, hybrid solutions, of, I believe, are being looked at. Though, but I, do, I don't want to say too much because, again, this is um, in development. It seems to me, uh, on a personal level, that it's a lot more challenging. Um, but again, we're talking about not long, we're not talking about long, long periods here. We're maybe talking about, you know, five, ten years, something along those lines. And then, of course, we had the announcement by Airbus, um, well, maybe a week or two ago, about the uh, Zero E concept probably a bit longer than a week now, um, where they've got three different uh, mock-up uh, solutions, all of those powered by a hydrogen or a hydrogen hybrid powertrain. Um, I put the, the links to the website on there. Um, and I also saw a, uh, an article by um, Aviation Week uh, just uh, today, strangely enough, um, and they've got, I put a link to that as well with electric regional aircraft and there are some eight or ten airplanes on there all, again, like I was saying, examples of what's happening now and, and uh, the solutions that are being proposed and how things are moving along. It seems to me they're moving pretty quickly. So, progress timelines, and this is really what st I started out looking at and realised I had to do a rather large preface. But it seems to me that the, as far as general aviation is concerned, the progress is already there. It, it's, it's happening, whether it happens in six months, whether it happens in a year, it, it's moving along quickly. There's multiple ideas, multiple offerings, battery, gas hybrid, all sorts of things going along. If you go to the exhibitions of light aircraft and general aviation, there's all sorts of solutions uh, being proposed. I think regional prop operations, um, I think that the universal hydrogen idea, and there are others, I mean, I've let, I, I haven't mentioned all of the ones that I've come across, I just used that one because it was of an interesting uh, and, and a relatively practical solution that I found at the time. Um, and it seems to me that that is a practical use for regional operations. It, it again, won't be for long range, but it makes... Uh, Propeller powered, uh, uh, small, uh, shorter range operations um, practical. It also, uh, once it happens, is um, it will, although the production of hydrogen and the cost of hydrogen may be more expensive than fossil fuels, it's likely that when it's considered against the avoidance of carbon taxes, um, that uh, it will have a, a great deal of um, attraction. And the interesting side, I think, which is, again, we're back to the intangibles again, 
But I think that the bragging rights of social responsibility and flying my airplane around and I'm not burning any fossil fuels um, is is incomparable. I think it, it brings all sorts of things. So it seems to me that if this is successful in the relatively short term, so we say five to eight, nine years, I think at that point the spread of regional jets uh, being powered by alternative energy will be almost unstoppable. I think regional jets, or the equivalent, whatever that works out to be, might be a little more um, problematic. I don't see burning direct hydrogen being a great solution in the short term. I think it'll take, it'll take a great deal more um, or more uh, work. Um, I may be wrong about that. I mean, it may be that somebody's coming up with that right at the moment. There's a great deal of, of um, research and, and development going on. But I would say that that looks to be quite viable within uh, the medium term. Um, and I think that um, once results start to come in, that at that point there, um, progress will be relatively very rapid. Um, I think I've really covered this mostly uh, already in the previous slide. I, I apologise, I meant to take the previous slide out. Um, but I do think that in the, um, the longer term, I need to also address uh, long-haul flights because long-haul um, causes uh, a lot more problems. Um, with the current aircraft sizes, which are obviously based upon airport handling capability generally, um, if you take the weight that you need of the hydrogen for comparable distances, although it's it's less than uh, jet fuel, um, it still occupies more volume than uh, the equivalent weight of fuel because we can't compress it beyond what we what we've got. So it's still heavy because the the um, the compression capsules have to be uh, reasonably heavy in order to um, be able to take the, the, the compression uh, pressures necessary. So reasonably speaking, long haul with hydrogen with current designs is not, it doesn't appear to be a very feasible solution. But the caveat to that is, is that it is also probably an engineering issue overall and I'm sure it can be solved. Um, but I'm not sure of the, the timescales and whether that would be short or medium or if there'll be any other effects. And so for the longer term, my own belief with this is that it's no longer acceptable to just consider it's going to be business as usual. That's my feeling. It sounds very harsh, I think, on the industry overall because we have made huge strides in efficiency up to now. Um, when you compare it compared to how efficient aircraft are now compared to what they were even 10, 15 years ago, it, it's enormous. But is it enough to go forwards and keep uh, travel in the realms of, of ordinary folks? I have my doubts. So my own feeling is we need an alternative for fossil fuel. Now whether that's hydrogen or liquid natural gas or something else, I'm I think the jury's still out a little, um, and I don't think that fossil fuel will be entirely replaced because it's debatable about the, the, the cost benefits involved. But I don't see that there's any alternative, two alternatives uh, going in the medium term. I have worked in this industry, as you know, for a very long time, and I really want to see air travel remain open to the wider public. And uh, I, th I think that this is a threat in the longer term to that, uh, that privilege. What does it mean for aircraft values for us, for, for lessors, for, for those with current technology aircraft? Well, if you go on my presentation here today, um, then uh, it, it seems to me that it's unlikely that wide body values will be affected in the short to medium term. I, I, it, it, it's, I can't see that happening without some radical change to what I've found so far. 
But I can see that hydrogen adoption will affect the regional jet world. Uh, the, the propeller, short range, up to say uh, eight, nine hundred uh, nautical miles thereabouts. Um, if this takes off and it works well, uh, pardon the pun, um, then I think that the, the change will become uh, unstoppable. I think it will come very quickly once it takes off, once it starts out. And I think that owners of, of regional jets may well see devaluation in those jets relatively quickly. Um, and the big caveat to that is, will this take off quickly or will it be a relatively slow pro uh, pace? And um, I think the proof of that's in the pudding. The narrow body uh, operators and values, I think will start to see devaluation probably around the 2033 to 2035 level when people like Airbus are uh, bringing their zero E ideas to uh, to the table and, and making them a viable option, alternative option. Um, they will no doubt be more expensive than, than current aircraft, but I think that social uh, ideas will have changed so much by then that it's difficult to see how it can be resisted. And I also believe that if you take something like the right one with the, the EasyJet uh, collaboration, and there are others out there, not just this one, um, then that may actually be accelerated uh, considerably. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to, to go along here with was the political effects and the social forces associated with all of these these ideas and will those change or will they, they, they accelerate or, or, or decelerate adoption. And I think one of the most interesting ideas is the political drivers that are opposing each other. Um, it seems to me that countries like the UAE with tourism dependency uh, and uh, a, uh, a very forward-looking way of, of, of life, I think, um, will see something like hydrogen and or its equivalent, nothing but a positive, uh, continuing to bring people to the door, bringing labour to the country and moving people around efficiently and effectively and also fossil fuel free. I think the opposing side of that are the countries with advanced economies, influential social media and I hate to say this but very much alarmist policies with regard to the pandemic um, and it's possible I can see that many of these countries may wish to prevent the return to mass air travel uh, and use that uh, safety issue as a, uh, as a as a reason behind it. Other drivers for it, I think business without a doubt will wish to ensure that mass transport continues. Um, I think OEMs and operators will go and swing with whatever happens, uh, a combination between cost and what can they make most efficiently and sell most effectively to their customers. But I think that social movements and social media will provide the greatest influence in many ways on progress, um, simply because uh, it has such an effect on, on government policy now, and it's very difficult to keep quiet. Um, and as these ideas take precedence and they start to have a groundswell, it'll be interesting to see whether they can be guided towards, yes, this is a great idea, yes, it's um, effective and, and cost effective um, and it, it will allow you to travel effectively or no we don't need to travel around that's the end of it let's stop it and, and, and put a brakes on it and then the final effect on this without a doubt is cost I mean everything always comes back down to can we afford it um, and I think the other question that we've got here is can we not afford it uh, you know it's a uh, Entering aviation is extremely costly, safety, testing considerations are immense and the jury to me is out whether that cost is too high for new entrants, although as I said at the moment we are seeing quite a lot of interest. So I believe not, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion either. So that's my lot. Um, 
I just thought I'd put a little note on here about Novus, who I work for. I thought I'd put a little plug in as I've done this. And uh, um, we are a local family-owned lessor uh, here in Dubai. And um, I work on the technical side, so that gives you a little bit of my background. And I'm opening this up to questions afterwards. So Peter, if you're ready to answer questions, we have one from Gabriel who's asking, liquid or gaseous hydrogen cooling in flight will require energy, which he assumes will come from the hydrogen itself. So is that energy requirement considered in calculating the overall efficiency of hydrogen as a fuel for aviation? Um, I, th I think that is a great question. Um, yes is the answer to that. Okay. Um, the, the, the issue is the energy necessary to produce the hydrogen has to come from another source. In in the the use of this energy is actually uh, sorry hydrogen is actually an energy carrier, and it's an efficient energy carrier, but it takes a lot of energy to produce the hydrogen in the first place. That energy or that process and, and the efficiency is only realised if, excuse me, the um, the, the energy used to, for the electrolysis and the production of hydrogen comes from a green source. It has to come from wind, geothermal, uh, solar, whatever it might be. Otherwise, you're really just kicking the can down the road. You're still using fossil fuels to make electricity, to make hydrogen and what have you. So the answer to the question is um, a little bit of both. Yes, it's been taken care of. Can it be effective and can it be cost effective is probably the major question here. This is whether, uh, you know, does it make movement from high, uh, fossil fuel to hydrogen too expensive or is it still effective? Thanks, Peter. I guess along the same lines, the third question would be, is it safe? So Javier is asking, as, I, as he understands, hydrogen is very flammable, so is it safe to use in aviation? Um, the answer to that is, is it's as safe as we choose to make it. Um, uh, is jet fuel safe? Well, yes, it is, um, under most circumstances. Um, but as we all found out to our cost um, some years ago, um, the vapour is extremely flammable and as a result we ended up putting uh, nitrogen inerting systems into the, the, the centre tanks on, on many aircraft. Um, that was a direct result of uh, a fuel that had been, that's been used for many, many, many years um, and has all of a sudden decided it's too dangerous to use in its current manner. Um, hydrogen, obviously, it's a, it's a source of energy, so by its nature it is it has an element of danger to it. It has to be handled well, it has to be handled carefully, um, and the systems used to handle it have to take into account take that into account. So that's the answer as far as I'm concerned is, is yes, it's dangerous in some ways, but it's certainly not, it, it will be handled and managed in a manner that mitigates that, uh, that danger, the same as any fuel. Thanks, Peter. Our next question is about the, the whole topic itself. So Madhav is asking, really a problem, what is the effect of the aviation industry dumping carbon in the, only in the upper atmosphere, whereas the rest of the industries are dumping it closer to the surface, around 92%? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, if I'm honest with you, I really do not know. I, the, the, the answer to that that I got is that the the, the, the small amount of research that I've done into it indicates that dumping hydrogen at out, oh, sorry, uh, dumping the carbon at altitude is more detrimental than dumping it at, at ground level. Um, how much more? Uh, I'm sorry, I really, that, that's not within the realms of what I found out. Hmm. All right. And going back to technical parts, um, what do you think about the potential usage of reversible fuel cell systems in aircraft? Um, well, um, <laughs> reversible fuel cells, I, 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 
you've still got to generate the power. A fuel cell, hydrogen carries energy, okay, and that energy is is um, is, is if you like installed in it by its by the by the nature of splitting it from its original carbon. You can do that on a local fuel cell. There's no doubt. You can take a um, a, a, a hydrogen generator um, and you can then take the hydrogen that's been generated from that and put, pass it through a fuel cell and you will generate electricity. The issue is how do you power the hydrogen generator in the first place? Well, if you drive it from solar cells, for example, or what have you, um, that's certainly viable. But can you get enough electricity from that on a local level? I would say probably not. And I think this is why I was trying to get at the idea that the most effective and the most efficient way of doing this is to have a central production of hydrogen um, and distribute it. Um, but that's what I also mentioned, the PEM process, which is, uh, if you like, a reversible fuel cell. It's a hydrogen generator. Um, and they are being looked at on a static basis in um, hydrogen charging stations in the US. So certainly that's a solution, but I, my feeling is, is that it's not a practical solution for aviation. Okay. All right, thank you, Peter. Our next question is about your company, NOAS. How is NOAS approaching the need to take account of environmental considerations in its fleet strategy? Um, we're at a, um, we're conscious of this. We're very conscious of the the uh, the industry that we're in and that we serve. At the end of it all, um, we are to a large extent at the, ex at the at the mercy of our lessees. I mean, what our lessees want to fly is what we want to produce but as a company we focused uh, very much on new technology aircraft and newer aircraft our fleet is is very young i think we've got an average fleet age of something in the region of around four or four and a half years don't quote me directly but it's somewhere in there um and and that is the the best way that we can um, provide solutions or not solutions but it, the current solutions that are available to the industry and so yes we're certainly uh, very much aware of that and, and uh, doing our best to um, work with it. All right thanks Peter. Um, our next question is from Islam he's asking how are Indian manufacturers responding to this change are they willing to invest in R&D to use hydrogen power for the good of the aviation industry and the planet? <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll have to ask them, uh, Islam. Um, my my view of the industry is is that effectively it's always driven by money. So I, I think that the the OEM engine manufacturers must be looking at alternatives. They they, they uh, they're very very cagey about information that they release because obviously it's such a, a it's such a costly business developing an engine. Um, there's not huge amounts coming out of any of them about what they're looking at in terms of alternatives at the moment. I mean, the big thing really still, um, and you see uh, GE working with um, Etihad and what have you, is for the use of sustainable fuels and, and making those viable. So certainly, there is research going on, and this is what I was talking about earlier on, where there's incremental changes and, and there's there's, mm. a, there's uh, attempts to improve current technology all the time. Um, where we are with step changes, I, 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 I think that's the jury's out on that as we stand at the moment. Mm. All right. Our next question is about what you mentioned about um, airports. Will airports need to be modified to be able to have hydrogen cell-powered aircraft operate on them? With the plans that are shown by Universal Hydrogen, the answer to that is uh, no. Um, the capsules are filled with the compressed and cooled hydrogen um, at the central charging point. They get loaded onto a standard truck 
you know, obviously converted and, and, and safe for the, the, the carriage of same. Um, the truck drives up to the aircraft and um, there's a, a lift bed on it and it the, the, the capsules get pushed straight in. So in those terms, I would say that the infrastructure needs are minimal, absolutely minimal. Okay, that's great. We have one more question about planning. How do airlines prepare for uh, future hydrogen powered aircraft in terms of maintenance and fleet planning? Um, I don't think that the operation of an aircraft like this is actually going to affect the operators as much as you may think. At the end of it all, um, the fuel will provide a certain amount of energy and it will dictate the range of that aircraft and therefore um, flight, uh, fleet ops and flight ops and, and what have you will have to have new charts and stuff. Mm. Uh, the, en the engines we would expect to, to largely operate similarly to current airplanes. I don't, I don't see that being very different. Maintenance, there may be some changes, but at the end of it all, it's a mechanical system providing um, uh, hydrogen instead of jet fuel. Okay. Um, so then you really just got the, the handling of the hydrogen itself. Uh, I, I really don't think that the... the I think the, the biggest effect, seriously, is probably on the on the operator's um, financial um, ways of looking at things. They will have to, perhaps, um, you know, the cash flows and things would have to, to, to be looked at and probably change somewhat. But overall, I, I think that the, the effects or the changes are relatively small, relative. Okay. Peter, um, Peter thank you very much. Lilithia, can I just, I'm just conscious of the time, I see sure. Archana, you had your hand up, so can we take one last question and then uh, I can wind up please, Archana. Thanks Martin, uh, thanks Peter for that, I just wanted to ask, uh, say for um, a normal lifetime of an initial operator taking up a hydro powered aircraft, say suppose it's about 10 to 15 years, what are the challenges that uh, lessers face in terms of leasing these aircrafts again in terms of demand, do you um, will you, do you think that you will, there will be difficulties in that sort? And the other aspect to that is that when we say that uh, there's a socially responsible image that comes in when uh, that contributes to its popularity, there is also this other side of it uh, of a public perception that is a fear of danger or flammability, like a colleague has already asked. So, what do you th what is your uh, take on that? Um, okay. Well, the first one. I mean, um, I I don't I, I don't really know what to say to you because, um, sorry, the the, the uh, social media side of things. I, I find the um, I, I think with the way that the modern world has come with social media, um, that you can really if you present things in a manner that works for the social media world then I think you can almost present whatever you wish. Um, there are elements of um, not danger but there are, you know that any fuel has to be handled with with care and and, uh, and control so um, what has to happen, in, in, as I would say in this case, is that the social media side of things has to emphasise and has to go and, and show that, you know what, that there, there needs to be I don't know, this YouTube videos of people moving hydrogen around carefully and all this kind of stuff. It needs to become a, a perception that, that is managed um, by the industry. I, I think that one of the reasons we've had in aviation, one of the problems we've had in aviation is I think we've actually in many ways handled the perception poorly in many cases. Um, uh, I think we've got to accept the fact that social media is a, a large force in the modern world and it has to be managed. Um, with regards to Lessor's uh, views or Lessor's manner of handling um, hydrogen uh, powered airplanes, I don't think again I don't see this as being um, a 
a difficult thing in the respect that the, the difficulty will lie in the um, initial um, introduction. Um, and I think that lessors will be reluctant initially until they see that there is a, a real market. One of the things that aircraft leasing needs is a broad base of operators, a broad base. As soon as you purchase an aircraft that has a very, very small um, base uh, of use, you then have a very small market and you are at the mercy of any small thing that happens. Which is one of the reasons why you see that lessors like, if you like, A320s, 737s. It's a huge base and it allows trading and it allows um, uh, amortising costs or moving, uh, amortising across a large base. So the initial impl the, the initial side of this will be that I suspect that there will be very few lessors initially. I think that they will charge quite a lot for it and then I think that as if it proves to be successful and it starts to take off then I think you'll see there will be no further issue and the biggest problem that will that lessors will then face is how do they manage the develop the evaluation of the aircraft the old generation aircraft that they already have in their fleets so um, it's a kind of a, a double-edged sword Peter, thank you very much for, for that. I'm going to draw Q&A to a close.